Hello everyone, Nicholson here, and welcome to Coming Soon Movie News with Nicholson. I'm your host, and on this show we're going to be breaking down all of the day's movie news, kind of giving a little bit of background into what it all means for the production in general, such as casting decisions, trailer announcements, director announcements, things like that. So, without any further ado, let's get into today's hot topics. And the first topic that we got to talk about today is one that I kind of figured was going to be happening. Um, I mean, it's been rebooted now, well, it's been rebooted once, it's been done twice, uh, both of them as television series, but now they are going to be moving ahead with a major motion picture version of this property. And I'm very excited to talk about the new upcoming Battlestar Galactica. And for those of you who don't know what Battlestar Galactica is or what it's about, it's basically, depending on which version of the show you're watching, whether it was the original 1978 version or if it was the new 2003 version that, that went on for about, I think it was a miniseries and four seasons, um... It's set in either the future or the past, again, depending on which version you're talking about. It's kind of like Star Wars, where it's like in a galaxy far, far away, a long time ago, that kind of thing. And uh, so it revolves around uh, the, in the mythology of the show, the original human population of the universe. And uh, it's essentially spread out, uh, all the humans are spread over 12 colonies, which are based on the 12 signs of the Zodiac. So you have, um, there's, what are some of the, there's, well, there's Caprica which is Capricorn. Caprica is the, their major city, like their capital, essentially. Um, then you have uh, Sagittarion. You have, um, is it Virgon? Uh, like, they're all, they, they all take elements from the names of the 12 signs of the Zodiac. And um, they had, in the new version at least, they had created um, these centurions, the, these basically, you know, robots, these androids that they called Cylons, and the Cylons had artificial intelligence, well the, the Centurions didn't, but uh, they, they basically rose up against the human uh, leaders essentially, and created an uprising, and it caused an entire like massive intergalactic war. Um, and so the the remake of the show, which started in 2003 as a miniseries, and then aired for four seasons on the Sci-Fi Network, uh, it was set I believe 40 years, either 30, no, it was 40 years uh, after the original Cylon uh, attack and invasion. And the show was about the last group of people, like the, the Cylons basically attacked with the help of, uh, unknowingly, at least it's alluded to throughout the series, but um, he unknowingly, Gaius Baltar, who was a human, inadvertently helped the Cylons with, Destroy, basically destroying mankind and eliminating everyone with the exception of about 50,000. That was about what was left. Um, and so the show is about the Battlestar Galactica, which is a giant Battlestar. It's one of their, it's like almost like an aircraft carrier, but in space. Um, and the colony, basically, all the ships that they can find, uh, they put them into this fleet. Like, uh, of, I think there's like 20 or 30 ships, there might be even more, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but it's about 48 to 50,000 survivors that are, that are around. And um, you find out that there, the Cylons have actually evolved, and now there are human Cylons, and there are 12 human Cylons, and the whole purpose of the story, like, on the surface it sounds like big, kind of over-the-top over sci-fi, but with, with them trying to find the Cylons, it's all about espionage, it's all about... Uh, you know, the, the decaying um, uh, conditions that these people are living in, the fact that these are the only people left in the entire universe, and they're all in search of the 13th colony, which is Earth. Um, and the Cylons are also trying to find that. And throughout the evolution of the show, you find out that, you know, the Cylons were a little bit misguided in what they were doing, and the humans... They, every, it's a very, very, very good show. It's one of my top ten shows. I'm actually re-watching it right now. I'm in the middle of season three right now. And it's just an unbelievably amazing show. So well written. The acting is superb. I mean, you got Edward James almost as Commander Adama, who turns into Admiral Adama. Um, you know, you have Katie Sackhoff, who uh, plays Starbuck, who that was that was a big controversial thing when when the show uh, started back up again. Was that Starbuck originally was a man. He was a male character, and he was actually played by uh, um, Dirk. Uh, oh, I can't think of the last name. It was the guy who played uh, Face um, in the original A Team show. And when when the show came back, like Boomer was uh, a woman. Boomer in the original show was a man. Boomer or um, 
Uh, Starbuck was a woman in the remake show. Like, they really changed it up. They kept the core essentials of what the show was about, but they really went a lot further. It, it was almost documentary style in the way that they shot. It was all handheld. It was all harsh lighting. It, just, it looked great. The mood they set was awesome. The action scenes were incredible. Uh, you know, massive space battles and whatnot. My favorite episode by far is, um, I think it's called Exodus Part 2. It's the beginning of Season 3. Uh, and, like, they, they jump the ship into atmosphere, and you see the ship pop into to atmosphere like just just this little pop and and they look up and and the ship's actually falling towards earth and as they're doing that they're doing it in order to save a whole bunch of people that are on this planet and so the ship is falling at free fall speed fire coming off of it because it's re-entering the atmosphere they launch all of their fighter jets so that they can do it inside the atmosphere and not have them enter in space and get attacked by the ships that are surrounding the planet and just before the ship's about to hit the ground and smash into the ground it jumps again and the fighters go in and just take out everybody it was so well done so exhilarating the 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 action the adrenaline of the show is just incredible the writing was spot on every time every character was different the the possibilities that this franchise has is incredible and and a lot of really talented people have been trying to get this movie made. Brian Singer uh, is probably the biggest spearhead of trying to get this movie made, or at least a version of this story told on the big screen. All the way back in 2001, he was involved in a new version of Battlestar Galactica. And he had just had X-Men come out. He was prepping X-Men 2, but he was hoping to do Battlestar Galactica before he had to move on to X-Men 2. And then, as most of you should know, there was a major event that happened in 2001 uh, in September with the terrorist attacks on New York that caused a whole bunch of delays on a whole bunch of different projects. I know that's not the serious aspect of that part, but I mean, at the end of the day, once we get past everything, it did affect a lot of people, um, not just the people who were affected just by the, the terrorist attacks, but I digress. He ended up having to uh, move on to do X-Men 2 because he was contractually obligated to work on that film. And that meant that he had lost interest in it. And that also meant that Fox kind of lost interest in it because they didn't have their spearhead on the project anymore. And then once that happened, the, the new TV series kind of evolved right from that. Um, and then went on, came out in 2003, went all the way till uh, 2007, I believe. And then... Uh, they tried to do a prequel series called Caprica, which was set about 50 to 70 years before the events of the remake of the show. And um, it lasted, I don't even think it lasted a season. Like, they canceled it right away because no one was watching it. Um, it. It didn't have the Battlestar Galactica name on it, which was good, but it did tie into it. But it didn't have any of the aspects of Battlestar Galactica that people tuned in for. Um, but then new hope started to arise. Uh, back in 2009... Um, Brian Singer actually was reattached to the film and as he was working on it he was also he had just finished Valkyrie and so he was really trying to get this new version of Battlestar Galactica made he said that it was going to be a complete reimagining again keeping the core aspects of the original story and structure in there but reimagining it for not necessarily modern audiences but a new generation of audiences um, but it was it was going to be almost a hybrid of the original 1978 show and the 2003 remake. Fun fact about the remake as well, Richard Hatch, who played the original um, Apollo, who is the main fighter pilot in the show, uh, he actually came back and played a major reoccurring role on the remake, which I thought was, was really interesting. I think there were a few other people involved in the original show that came back, but Richard Hatch was definitely at the forefront, uh, which I thought was a really nice touch, and he played a really great role, and it was nice, those scenes between uh, Jamie Bamber, who played the new Apollo, and Richard Hatch, who played the original Apollo, when, when they were sharing scenes. It was you could almost tell the little nuances that they were picking up off one another. I thought it was a little interesting touch. Um, but as of right now, they're working on a new version of it. And again, it's said to be, it, they're kind of continuing where Brian Singer was um, when he, he ended up having to leave the project in order to finish work on Jack the Giant Slayer, which he was contractually obligated through Warner Brothers to do. Um, and now, obviously, he's back in the X-Men universe, so he's pretty much dropped off uh, this project. So he's not going to be coming back, but they got Jack Plagan, or Palgan, sorry. And Jack Palgan uh, only has one screenwriting credit to his name, and it hasn't even come out yet. <laughs> it's uh, Transcendence. Now, with, with uh, that's the new Johnny Depp movie, uh, Morgan Freeman, Paul Bettany, uh, that's coming out, I believe, next Friday, the 18th. Yeah, April 18th is when it's coming out. But if, if they're given this guy... Battlestar Galactica, that means that Transcendence got to be one hell of a script, 
which I mean, I'm I'm really excited about that to begin with. I mean, it's Wally Fister's first directorial debut. Wally Fister, if you don't know, he was the director of photography on every single Christopher Nolan movie, as well as movies like Moneyball and and countless others. But um, when you think about that, like that's The Dark Knight, that's Inception, that's The Prestige, Batman Begins, Memento, Insomnia. Uh, I, you know, like ev every one of those movies is phenomenal. They're so beautiful to look at and. Him coming in and actually directing this really cool new sci-fi flick with Johnny Depp as the main the main character, based on this guy's script. I mean, that's got a lot of talent behind it. And now that he's been picked up to do Battlestar Galactica, saying that the the, the rumor at least going out now is it's going to be a reimagining, but set it is said to be in between the '78 and and 2003 movie, uh, or 2003 show, I should say. And so that to me means. The, the 1978 version was kind of hokey, like it was campy, it, it had a 70s feel, they didn't have a big budget, so they couldn't really do all the stuff that they wanted to try to do. And when the 2003 version came out, it was very dark, very real, very hard, gritty, um, just a great, great show. And so if they try to, to appeal to that show, I think this movie definitely has a chance, and this could even spawn... A new series where they can do because the studios are now looking at properties which they can put into multiple territories so you got like uh with the dark tower adaptation you know they're wanting to do movies with in between the movies are going to be television shows they're going to be you know 12 episode seasons set in between these two movies and uh they, they've been trying to get that done with star wars as well they've been trying to do a live action star wars show i don't know how how that or whether or not that's still going to be moving forward with the new series coming out that or the new uh movie franchise coming out as well as the spin-off films that'll be happening between those so it's too early to tell with, with something like that but this could severely lead into a new television series with a cohesive storyline spread between the show and a movie start off with a movie lead into a show have one or two seasons and then come up with another movie that ties into the series and then do two more seasons and a final movie to finish off the trilogy and close it off i think that's a brilliant way to do it be one hell of a job to do because I mean, you gotta you gotta factor in the people who are going to be involved in the movie for the most part are also going to be involved in the TV show. That does not give them a lot of time. You, they, you know, they gotta they gotta prep a movie, build the sets and everything like that, six, eight, ten, twelve months before they're actually going to shoot. And so, if you're doing that with a television show, you're doing it a couple of weeks before you're going to shoot. So you have to have your entire show uh, season set up and written and know the major plot points that you have to hit. So that the movie script can be finished in time so that you can write it like there's so much stuff that would have to be done with that and you'd have to have so many people in so many different spots co uh, coordinating everything It'd be very difficult but it is possible and if they were to do something like that what it kind of like what marvel and agents of shield now is like if you watched agents of shield at the beginning it wasn't a very good show but now it's it's become a very good show i still need to get caught up on the last two episodes but I mean, it, compared to what it started off as, it's now got a cohesive narrative to it. It's it's working its way into the Marvel Cinematic Universe without feeling like a basically like a procedural ripoff. So, if they're able to do something like that with this property, I th that's unbelievable. Like, I can, I'm so excited about this. I cannot wait for this project. I love Battlestar Galactica. It's one of my favorite shows out there. I just love sci-fi. I love the creativity behind it, the imagination behind it, and the fact that. When you, when you think about what could potentially be done with these shows, I mean, it, there's no end in sight. I mean, you could literally do anything. So it's got a lot of potential. I'm really excited about it. And when we get more information about it, I'll definitely update you guys on here. So let's get into the next uh, topic about, the, about today. And this trailer is unbelievable. I have, a, I have a link in the description below so you guys can definitely check it out if you haven't already. But the new trailer for Scarlett Johansson in Lucy uh, debuted last week. And holy crap, does this movie look cool. I, this came right out of nowhere. I had no idea. Like, I, I'd heard rumblings about her doing a movie, of, uh, you know, being kind of a, a badass assassin, being directed by Luke Besson. Uh, and if you know anything about Luke Besson's work, uh, like, the, um, he's done, his more recent stuff has been, like, The Family with Robert De Niro. He did The Transporter. Uh, I think he actually only wrote The Transporter. I don't think he directed it. Uh, no, Louis Louis Leterrier directed the second one. I don't think he directed the first one, but I know Luc Besson wrote them. Luc Besson also wrote uh, like Taken and, and Taken Two. He's writing Taken Three. Um, you know, he did Leon the Professional. Um, but the one thing that really has me excited about this, he also did The Fifth Element, which is one of my favorite sci-fi films out there. And this movie, it looks like it's limitless with superpowers. Like you take you take um, the the 
capability of someone taking a pill or taking a drug of some kind and then getting to access more than just the 10 15 percent of the brain that normal people get access to but with this instead of in limitless with bradley cooper where he just he's able to you know predict stock options and and really be able to calculate a lot of different things really be able to see certain things the way you know other people can't see them this movie takes it a whole nother level and you know she's able to she's able to take a belt and just throw it wrap it around a table pull and it grabs right around the right spot pulls it over to her she's able to I mean, some of the more fantastical elements you know as as she starts getting access to more and more and more of her brain capacity um, it looks to be that she can see any type of signal wireless signal that is streaming from anything whether it be a car phone building uh, anything like that and she can actually like, she grabs it pulls it in makes it bigger so she can read it like the the sci-fi capabilities of this again kind of touching back to what I talked about with uh, Battlestar Galactica is just unbelievable like the the fact that that this movie has been so under the radar up until now is it fascinates me like I can't, I can't believe that they have not been trying to promote this harder, or at least saying, you know, here's a still, here, here's a good idea of what the movie's going to be. This came right out of left field. And, I mean, it doesn't hurt that you got Morgan Freeman in there. Uh, like, I, I could not get over how surprised I was by this trailer. Uh, the ending of the trailer where, um, where the, there's a guy in the hallway sh holding a gun at her, and she's just slowly walking up to him. There's a, crew, a group of people, probably 12, 14, 15 people, and she just goes like that, and they all just collapse. And he's standing there with his gun and his gun's just shaking and she's just slowly walking towards him. I mean, it could be bad. I'm going to lay it out there right now. It could be bad. Luc Besson does not have the greatest track record. He has an awesome track record. Don't get me wrong. A lot of his movies have been hits, but he's had some misses as well. So this could potentially, I, I, oh, I don't know how it could. I really don't, I mean, obviously there is a possibility that it could, so I'm trying not to get myself too excited, but, uh, you know, I mean, the, the fact that it's, it's expanding, you know, people's understanding of what could be, what the brain could possibly be capable of. I mean, obviously not the major fantastical elements where she's standing in Times Square and she just goes and freezes time. And then goes like that, and everything is just rewinding. You start seeing the the buildings start being, you know, deconstructed. And I, I mean, that obviously couldn't happen. You should, you couldn't be walking down the hallway and all of a sudden grow your hair and change the color of it. Like, but the fact that you could understand certain things, you might be able to see things differently. You might even be able to see different spectrums. You, you wouldn't obviously. It wouldn't be something tangible that you could touch because if you can't touch it now, you just because you can see it doesn't mean you would be able to touch it. So I mean, being able to see something like wireless signal or seeing uh, you know, the, the lifeblood of a tree or whatever that sequence was, you know, like the capabilities of the human brain have only been touched on by about 10%. Like we're only at 10, maybe 15% capacity for like geniuses, you know? And so being able to, to access more than 10, I mean, that's going to be, I, I have a feeling with Limitless being so successful, if this turns out to be a big success, we could start seeing a lot more movies like this. Um, which to me, this is a great, thinking man sci-fi movie kind of with a superhero you know like she literally can act like a superhero you see her uh doing a whole caveat of different things it just looks awesome i am super excited about this movie i cannot wait for this to come out and i believe it comes out in august so definitely check back on that and if i get more information about this i will definitely be updating you guys on the show so definitely keep up with that and the last major piece of news today, the last part of Hot Topics, is uh, Marvel, Ke Kevin Feige, or uh, an associate of Kevin Feige actually came out uh, at the end of last week, I believe, and stated that uh, they have a rough outline of their Marvel film slate all the way up to 2028. Uh, for those of you unaware, this is 2014, so that is 14 years away. If you do, that's, you, you know, that takes us to Avengers 6. That's phase six. Think about that for a second. We're not even done phase two. And the amount of Marvel movies that we've had come out of Marvel already. Imagine four more phases. Like they, they'll have had 11 movies out by the end. I believe it's 11. Um, by the end of Avengers 2. 2028. <laughs> like, I mean, I do, I, obviously this is something that can change. They can always, I mean, it's probably just written in pencil. You know, if, um, if, I'm going to 
minor spoiler for Captain America. This doesn't really change anything. Um, but I did say uh, on my review yesterday that, that there was a little nod to another character um, when they were talking about Stephen Strange. And, uh, and that basically hinted at the fact that he's going to be coming up real soon. I'm, I, you can put money on it that he's going to be part of Phase 3. Guaranteed. Um, there's a rumor going around um, that Nathan Fillion did a, uh, he, uh, he did a little tiny role in Guardians of the Galaxy. For those of you who don't know, Nathan Fillion is a very good friend of both Joss Whedon, who did uh, The Avengers, working on The Avengers 2, uh, and James Gunn, who is currently directing uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. And so he's been involved in a lot of their projects. They're good friends, even outside of working together. And he was at a convention uh, two, three days ago, and somebody asked him, with his you know connection to Joss Whedon and to James Gunn, would he, did he have a scene or did he want a scene uh, to shoot in Guardians of the Galaxy? And he goes, what did he say? He went, wanted a scene or got one? I don't know. And the way he did it, he played it up. He was really kind of fun with it, too. He goes, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe, uh, and he's just, he's, you know, flipping through something. And he's like, hey, maybe you'll have to check the credits. I really don't know. Maybe it'll be a surprise in there for you. And so some people took that to say that, okay, he's just going to be a small role, uh, just like a little throwaway character. Maybe, you know, somebody who works for the Nova Corps with uh, John C. Riley's character. Other people took that to mean that he's actually going to be involved in one of the after credit scenes. And if that's the, like, the, the thing that that could lead into, and I don't think that this would be the case, I'm pretty sure that Guardians of the Galaxy is either going to have a lead into Avengers 2 or it's going to have a lead into Ant-Man. Um, but some people are assuming that Nathan Fillion is the new Doctor Strange, is Stephen Strange. And if that's the case, finally Nathan Fillion is in the Marvel Universe. I mean... I was I've been hoping for the I was hoping for him for Ant Man, although I have no problem whatsoever with Paul Rudd. And when that casting came out, I went, "That's I like that's a good choice." You know, it's not I don't know hardly anybody out there who tried to dispute that casting. He's a very good choice, a very good fit for that role. And when you when you look at you know when you look at Nathan Fillion, he's perfectly suited to be a superhero. He's got that charisma. If anyone who's seen Firefly knows exactly what I'm talking about, or even Slither, like that's their main connection right there. James Gunn directed Slither. Uh, Nathan Fillion was the main actor in that movie. Um, you know, now he's on the show Castle. The dude just oozes charisma. Like he's got he's got the ability to play a leading man. A lot of people want him for the role of Drake uh, in an Uncharted movie. I would flip a coin between him and Bradley Cooper. And both of them would be perfect fit for that role. Like they would both be a little bit different, but they both very good fits for that role. But Nathan Fillion coming in and playing Doctor Strange, awesome, awesome choice. I think that's inspired. I mean, if they were able to do that, not only would that you'd have so many fanboys happy. Finally, I mean, getting getting the biggest you know geekdom out there uh, involved in a Marvel project, absolutely, absolutely. And if that ends up being true, then that's that's just incredible. Um, Marvel has already kind of put themselves in a little bit of a bind with getting uh, very high talented actors for roles that only are going to be for one movie. Like you look at Tommy Lee Jones in Captain America, clearly he's not going to be coming back in any more movies because the dude was, his character was in his 60s, maybe even his early 70s, I'm not exactly sure how old Tommy Lee Jones is, I'm pretty sure he's in his 60s, um, put it back in World War II, so 70 years ago, can't be 130, just can't be, he'd be dead. Um, so, I mean, they did that, uh, when you look at, like, Jeff Bridges and Iron Man, you look at, um, what would be another good, good choice? Uh, well, I mean, they ended up having to replace him, but Edward Norton, um, you know, they, they've had a, a lot of one-off actors, Mickey Rourke, for instance, as just the villain in Iron Man 2, which, that was just a waste, um, so with getting someone like Nathan Fillion involved in Doctor Strange, he's obviously going to sign a 6, 7, 8, 10, 12 movie deal. Who knows? Um, um, oh, what's his name? Plays Falcon in Captain America. Why am I? Anthony Mackie. Anthony Mackie was just doing an interview uh, for Captain America, and they asked him about, like, were you worried or skeptical about signing the six, the, the multi-picture deal? And he goes, no, man, I have no idea why people are so, like, I don't want to sign my life away. I don't want to be part of a, a movie that's going to make a billion dollars, you know, a franchise that's just going to make a lot of money and be successful and be seen by a lot of people and really have a lot of fun with it. 
I don't understand those people. He's, he's like, if, if they wanted me for 12 movies, I would have signed. If they wanted me for 15, I would have signed. I love doing these movies. And so, I mean, that really brings into, I mean, it could also mean that Anthony Mackie wasn't getting the types of roles that he wanted. And now with Marvel coming in and saying, you, here's six movies for you, uh, or up to, I should say, I should clarify that, up to six films. Um, then he's jumping all over that because that's a role that he really identified with. He really liked it. He he found a lot of things about it that he really liked, and you know he he really went with it. So I mean, getting someone like Nathan Fillion in for six films, he's not gonna say no to that. Like he, of course, he would he would want to do something like that. I mean, clearly his commitment to Castle would interfere with that uh, to a certain extent, not completely. I mean, they they would be able to work out that schedule, but. I mean, if they severely have this up until 2028, DC's got to look at that and just start crapping in their pants. Like, I, it's not DC is not obligated to follow the same model that Marvel is. They're not obligated to do that whatsoever. It would, it, I mean, it wouldn't hurt them, you know, to do the individual standalone films all leading up to a major, you know, Justice League movie, and then have more independent, uh, independent films uh, from one another, and then coming back together again in a Justice League movie. But they don't have to adhere to that. And even David Goyer did an interview, who's the the person who, who wrote Man of Steel, and he's he's writing or he was the original writer for Batman vs Superman, and you know he came out and said that we're not we're not really at that stage yet to be doing a cohesive universe. So they they do have that in mind, but they're not obligated to do it. So we don't know exactly what DC's plans are going to be, but the fact that Marvel has their plan, their movies planned out for the next 14 years, um, you know, that's incredible. They probably have, you know, like Doctor Strange 4 or, um, you know, Thor slash Cap 7 so that they could have Thor and Captain America team up in a movie. Like, you know, they might do that. Um, but, I mean, we don't know. A lot of these actors are signed up for multiple films, so we don't even know what the character aspirations are going to be at that point. It's going to take a long time for us to figure that out. But when we do find more out, I will definitely update you guys. Well, that'll about do it for all the main topics. Now we're going to get into rapid fire. So rapid fire, i got a few little topics here to talk about, just little things uh, to, to putter off before the end of the show. But before I get into that, I just want to let you guys know that you can definitely submit your questions. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or concerns or anything of that sort, you can send them to movienewswithnicholson at gmail.com or you can add me on Twitter at Nicholson, N-I-K-L-S-U-N and you can shoot me a question on there or even just put a comment in the comment section below. Uh, so let's get into rapid fire. So the first topic on rapid fire is Matt Gerald. Um, no one would, would probably recognize his name, but you would definitely recognize his face. Um, he was one of the main antagonists in Avatar. Uh, he's had a couple of other film roles after that, uh, but he has now been cast as a villain in Marvel's upcoming Ant-Man with um, Paul Rudd, Michael Douglas, and um, we don't know any of this, the logistics of his role, what character he's playing, whether or not it's the main villain, if it's a secondary villain, we don't know any of that yet. The movie is still on track for a release date of, tw of July 2015. Um, there's going to be starting filming soon if they haven't already. I don't think they've started filming yet, but I think they're going to start filming as soon as this summer. Um, and, and so once they get closer to filming, we're going to get a lot more information about that. But I just thought I'd let you guys know that they have cast the villain. So the cast is rounding out. You got, uh, like I said earlier, you got Paul Rudd, you got Michael Douglas, Michael Pena, uh, has, I believe been confirmed. Evangeline Lilly has been confirmed. Um, and now we add Matt Gerald into the mix. So, I mean, you know, there's a really eclectic cast that's going along with this movie. I'm very excited. And I mean, on top of that, you got Edgar Wright directing. I mean, the guy who did the Coronado trilogy. You know, the, the Blood and Ice Cream trilogy, as they call it, with Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, and World's End. So, I mean, the, the guy knows what he's doing. This is going to be a really quirky movie. I'm really excited for it. I love how Marvel is starting to shake things up. Um, so, let's get on to the second topic of Rapid Fire. Second one is, with the upcoming Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, they've actually done a slight casting change, even though the movie's only a few months away from being released. And that's Johnny Knoxville and Tony Shalhoub have both been selected to replace, or to become, sorry, the voices of Leonardo and Splinter, respectively. So, uh, Johnny Knoxville will be playing Leonardo, which... To me, that's one of the weirdest casting decisions ever. He's, uh, he would come across more as a Michelangelo than anybody else. You know, kind of the jokey, goofy guy. Leonardo is the leader. He is the one that they all respect, the one that they all look up to. Raphael is the badass. He's like the bouncer of the, of the group. Leonardo is the leader. Donatello is the techie guy. And then Michelangelo is 
for all intents and purposes, he's the stoner. <laughs> um, and then you got Splinter and Tony Shalhoub coming in. I mean, he is a very talented actor. Very talented actor. Anyone who's seen any of his work in the past knows exactly what the guy's capable of doing. Especially in Pain and Gain. I really liked his role in Pain and Gain. And he was a quick replacement. That was originally supposed to be John Turturro's role. Uh, but when he came in to play the, um, the the rich guy that they go and attack, uh, he did. I felt he did a great job. I love that movie. That movie was great. Um, but he's been brought in to voice Splinter. So I don't know why. And, and if they're only bringing these two guys in, why is it just these two? Because they got Danny Woodburn. Anyone who know, who watched Seinfeld, uh, Danny Woodburn was the the dwarf on uh, on Seinfeld. He was cast as Splinter. He did the motion capture for Splinter, uh, and was supposedly going to be doing the voice. And I, I'm unsure of the guy who's playing Leonardo, but uh, there were three other actors who they who they cast. And um, when when you deal with someone like recasting only Johnny Knoxville for the voice of Leonardo. I mean, that to me doesn't make any sense. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but if we get more information or if they announce the other cast members, I'll definitely update it on the show here. And the last piece of news is uh, something that I talked about on the show before uh, with Drew Goddard. Drew Goddard uh, was selected to write the upcoming Sinister Six movie for Sony that's going to tie into the Spider-Man universe, uh, but it was just confirmed uh, the other day that he has actually been selected to direct the movie as well. I did say that he was most likely going to direct uh, but it's now been confirmed he's writing and directing uh, the upcoming Sinister Six movie, most likely eyeing for a 2019 release, because uh, you got Amazing Spider-Man 2 is releasing this year. Amazing Spider-Man 3 is coming out in 2016. Venom, and after, after Spider-Man 3, they're looking at doing a Spider-Man movie every year. So that means that we got Spider-Man 3 in 2016. We got Venom in 2017. We have Spider-Man 4 in 2018. And then... Uh, Sinister Six in 2019. Unless they're doing two a, a year, which I doubt they would do. They're going to spread this out as far as they can. Um, but the reason that they're having to wait so long, and the reason that Venom is going to come first, is because Sinister or um, Goddard himself is actually working on the Daredevil series for Netflix. So he's going to be shooting the 13 episodes all at once uh, with Daredevil. They're also doing a Luke Cage, uh, Jessica Jones, and uh, Iron Fist TV shows, all 13 episodes each, and then they're all going to pair up in a Defenders TV series of 13 episodes as well. So it's going to be basically five seasons worth of shows all at once. They're going to be doing the four all at once, I believe, and then the Defenders is going to air after that. Um, so once he's done working on the Daredevil series, then he's going to siege into working on Sinister Six. So once we get more concrete information about that, I'll definitely update you guys on here. But uh, up in, uh, until then, this has been Coming Soon Movie News with Nicholson. Thank you so much. You guys have been a great audience. Uh, if you Again, if you have a comment or a question you'd like for us to discuss on the show, please go ahead and put it in the comment section. You can also email me at, coming, or at uh, moviewnewswithnicholson at gmail.com, or you can go on Twitter and add me on Twitter at Nicholson, N-I-K-L-S-U-N. Uh, and definitely follow me on there because anytime movie news comes out, I will be tweeting about it, and then I will be trying to cover as many uh, topics as I can on the following show. So... Um, with this upcoming Friday, there's no real major new releases, so I don't know if I'm going to be doing a major uh, movie review, but I may even talk about a movie that came out a while ago and just kind of touch on certain points about why I liked it, maybe one that's not universally liked, uh, you know, but uh, put in the comment section whether or not you, you have a, a film that you'd like me to discuss on Friday's episode. So, without any further ado, this has been Coming Soon Movie News with Nicholson. I am Nicholson, and thank you so much for watching. You guys have been great. Go ahead and click the subscribe button so that you can get all your updates. Uh, and again, don't forget to add me on Twitter, at Nicholson, N-I-K-L-S-U-N. But until next time, you guys have been great. Thank you so much, and you take care.